name is Hillary Bailey Burnett, and I own H. Bailey Curated Resale in the heart of Seattle, in uh, Pioneer Square. You grew up in Seattle? Yeah, I'm a, a native. I'm a rare native. Yeah. Well, I was a Pilates teacher. Well, way back in the day, I was a fitness instructor with a striped leotard, a skinny belt, leg warmers, inflatable yeah. high tops, I could see and that. a headband. So yeah. you can see that's what the roots of <laughs> fitness. You didn't want to dress up that way for Halloween no. today. <laughs> no. um, and then um, during uh, our years of we call it mating and breeding, having four <laughs> babies. <laughs> That's a good thing. I was, uh, I was a fitness teacher and then I morphed into the Pilates world and before people even said the word Pilates. So I was really oh. into um, alignment training and teaching, morphed from there into a yoga teacher. And along the way, uh, became a personal stylist as a side hustle, mm -hmm. a side gig. Started to do some pop-up um, shops with my sister of curated cool th cool things. And um, so that was a side gig for mm -hmm. a long time while I was teaching uh, Pilates and yoga in North Seattle. And taking care of kids. And taking care of kids and you know and then all the kids were grown and um, my husband was in a career change and I had the chance to pause my work and I was ready for a reinvention and I had this internal sense this is about three and a half years ago mm -hmm. of uh, do hard things and I was ready to let go of being the teacher and I had an inkling that CrossFit would be the next step because it was out of my comfort zone and I knew that if I I wanted I wanted to, to do something um, from the inside without having to also be the leader of it mm -hmm. I wanted the luxury of being taught yeah. and have it being the beginner and and not having to run ahead of myself and then teach it for a living. Mm -hmm. So I was going to maybe shift gears in my work and I had this internal mantra, this was summer of 2015, do hard things. So one was signing up for CrossFit and I would walk from our apartment, by now my husband... You've only done it? Oh, 2000, okay, so three, private. Three and a half years. Okay. Yeah. So I'd walk from, by this time my husband and I were in um, little cool apartments in Seattle on our own um, anticipating a change maybe even a relocation out of mm -hmm. Seattle as he was job hunting do hard things so I'm walking to CrossFit I can't even really breathe properly and I'm praying the whole way and you know doing the two-week intro and just you know so much of it seemed so far from me but at the same time I could I, I loved it and I had 
so many years of alignment in my body that I knew I could do it well. Mm -hmm. uh, so do hard things, just doing that. And that same summer, as a self-empowerment move, uh, I've got a very large tattoo on the back of my <laughs> leg, okay. which I don't know, we can do a, a viewing of it later. <laughs> yeah. um, Cut to the tattoo. <laughs> yeah. And for some personal reasons, it was a, a very empowering okay. thing. It was, I did not know that the back of the knee is where you're really not supposed to get a tattoo. Yeah, that sounds terrible. Ever. <laughs> so that was the second thing. And the third thing came upon me, and I did not ask for it, but I got... Uh, in this time of um, reinvention, possible relocation, we temporarily then moved in with our oldest daughter, okay. our son-in-law-to-be, and our grandson. And so the third th hard thing came to me, which was I got the worst phone call that you ever want. Said my husband's name on my uh, phone, but when I picked it up, it was not my husband. It was the emergency room doc and uh, he had gone out for a run at seven and by eight I was getting just a little and then um, got that call and then my life imploded the, um, it was like the scene for, do you know the movie Amelie mm -hmm. oh you have to see okay. it where she dissolves uh -huh. okay. into I water mm -hmm. and um, but I was uh, there with some, my daughter, got on the phone with the doctor right away. My son-in-law drove me to the hospital. He had gone down with sudden cardiac arrest. And uh, a man with a dog named Sully uh, came upon him and gave him life-saving CPR. And then the whole fire department medic team came. I saw him next at the hospital, and that began a vigil that I thought would be a long, long-term thing, and all the family was there. My brother and sister-in-law flew in. One of our kids was in Spain. One was, where were they all? One was in Portland, one was, I can't remember, but all of a sudden we're all at the hospital and we're in this vigil not knowing. Uh, he was fit and so the doctors were puzzling, didn't, didn't know. Anyway, to condense that story, they put him in deep freeze that night. It's a, it's a technique to try to save the brain. Mm -hmm. The doctor said, I'm not going to go in and try to figure out what's going on with his heart because I don't know if he's... A vegetable mm -hmm. and I was suddenly in a small small space like a cocoon space um, but I stayed internally praying and uh, so they said we'll warm him on Wednesday he went down on Monday mm -hmm. he said we'll start to warm him up on Wednesday. But we won't know anything about his brain until Saturday. But they warmed him up and I had, my sister-in-law had said, put on your running clothes that morning. We're gonna go out for a run. This is at Virginia Mason. Mm -hmm. And she said, are you ready? I said, no. She said, come on, we're going. <laughs> so she took me on this run around Capitol Hill, Hill Hill, and she would she would run in front of me, she just would point the way we were turning. And I I said on this run, I have to make peace with the uphill parts of life. And um, then she was taking a phone call while we were running and she said, Come on, we have to get back. <laughs> so then we're running back and um, they had started to warm him. Uh -huh. They extubated him. I ran back into the doorway of the hospital. He had burst awake and turned and looked at me, and I knew he was going to be all there. Huh. So, wow. It took through the night and to the next day for him to integrate his brain with his body. He was really confused and kept doing these same repetitive things over and over. Anyway, they discovered. Uh, 
probable, uh, probably a genetic uh, blockage. His grandfather had dropped dead at 48 so, of um, a heart issue. So they went in then, found one artery called the Widowmaker, blocked. They put in a stent and said, you can go home tomorrow. <laughs> so we went home Friday. <laughs> no. and so it was a, and that was shocking on its own. So that was the third oh hard gosh. thing three and a half years ago that kind of gave me. Oh, I'm open at noon. I'm at, I'll be open at noon. OK. <laughs> I don't know what she's saying. <laughs> she's saying do you have editing um, capability? Um, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Extensive. Right. Okay. Do they know? 12? Is it okay? Can I pause? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's true. That's oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what, what I thought. Oh, yeah. uh, so, do you want to ask a question? I just like no, da, 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 da. no, we're good. Okay. It doesn't matter. So, so, so Friday, you guys go home. Yeah. <laughs> then the the reinvention. So the I can't space. Can imagine I know, that. I know. Yeah. Week. So this little season of do hard things. That was mm -hmm. the one that was. The hardest, obviously, and uh, so here we sit then in this time of do hard things, reinvention, and now a kind of liberation of life and um, extreme gratitude, mm -hmm. and kind of uh, you know just opened up to possibility opened up to change in a way that you know, had expanded after that dramatic experience. And so it turned out that my husband's job uh, was, it was here in South Bellevue. And so then, okay, now where are we going to live? And um, we had been given a gift of a down payment to get back into the housing market and we my sister had said under her breath in the hospital I think you should get rid of that money meaning put it try to put it into a house because this hospital bill is mm. gonna be ginormous mm -hmm. and that stuck in my head and after he lived we just decided let's just play let's have an attitude of play in this house hunt get out there, see if we can snag something. And uh, we, we wanted to uh, be within our means. So we uh, headed to South Seattle and found a fabulous place and uh, moved there the, I guess the winter of 2015. And setting up house and I thought, well, I've got to get some little job to kind of take me in a direction as I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do. And I started to work for, since I had decided to not be the yoga teacher anymore, giving up that teaching role was a freeing and good step. I found a little menswear boutique in uh, Columbia City, a South Seattle neighborhood, and started working, thinking it would just be a little, a little thing uh, to rev up my style business, have a boutique connection, uh, but it turned out I sort of got into the nitty and gritty of that little place and started to figure out what would I do if I was going to be running my own shop. Mm -hmm. So spent a year there um, brainstorming and uh, creating focus and by the time I was uh, re ready to move on uh, I had some inventory and I was setting out to look for space in this again staying in the play of of work mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that brings us here huh. so I opened November 10th 2017 and no I, 2000 what year is this 18 <laughs> 17 yeah I, yeah. <laughs> I got you I think we're off I got you uh, 2000 okay say that again you opened in, let's 
2017. Established 2017. It's on my ring. And had you um, owned your own business before? No. No. It, well, in a sense, I've okay. always leaned towards self employment, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. uh, but but not a have, hadn't had a brick and mortar shop. Uh, so yeah, it was. Why men's? Well, to be, it's underrepresented mm -hmm. in Seattle, menswear. And so there's a, there's a pocket for me to, to fill. Um, I lean towards strong, I lean towards masculine. I like the idea of daily wear. I'm, I'm not so interested in fancy red carpet. Mm -hmm. I love um, wardrobing, wardrobing from the standpoint of find go-to pieces that can work together and mix and match. And so the, um, I can say maybe the spirit of menswear is a little, leans more in that direction. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't interest me. To, I, I, it's fun to do fancy and I've styled, uh, I'm working on styling our daughter's wedding right now for next summer. and. I do like to do suity things and um, glamorous things, but I, I love the, the whole of the, the daily wardrobe, and so menswear is a lot about that. And uh, also because there's a missing um, representation of creating suits and masculine clothing for all sorts of bodies, men, women, people who don't non-binary people and I knew there was a chance to um, create a space in Seattle where the energy was easy and welcoming and uh, adding the tailor has given me the, mm -hmm. the um, juice to be able to offer that to Seattle. Yeah. So. We were saying before um, that that is what draws me. I always, I like wait for your posts and your pictures and your people because yes. they're real people. Yes. And that's yeah. what I, I, yeah. I just think it's cool to see real people. Right. Oftentimes when you think about style or I think um, men and women, but I bet especially men just because I've heard my husband talk when he wants to like change his style or yeah. dress nicer it's intimidating because everything you see in the malls and the stores yeah. is so like yeah. straight and narrow yeah, for yeah, the, yeah. you know, the petite man yeah. or whatever you yeah, call yeah, that yeah, version yeah. of the man, yeah. Yeah. you know, and that's not him. Yeah. And that's not a lot of people. And so when it's I see your pictures, oh, yeah. I just love yeah. it. I'm like, and it just must be, uh, just super rewarding to yes. see like, empowering like, like that, the, like the guy. Calvin. Like I know. Film. I know. I know. And you probably feel so good. Yeah. I don't know. When yeah. you find your style or you dress good, yeah. I think you feel good. And well, it's part of self-expression. It's part of identity. It's part of feeling good in your body, mm -hmm. matching the clothing to what you're doing. Your did them. Was it um, more women's wear? More women's? Yeah. yeah. And I have a background in women's wear, too. I used to work for a very high-end boutique in Seattle. Um, and that's one of the places where I got the sense of strategic wardrobing because we worked with not just random shoppers we would have clients who were coming in mm. to to invest in their wardrobes and whether you're investing a little or a lot that comprehensive view of of clothing mm -hmm. is uh, it's a satisfying way to go I imagine uh, I the way we were moving through the floor what you don't want is dead space on the floor and our movement in the natural way we do business with the tailor, his apprentice, and me brings enough action to the floor that the... There wasn't a third one that was needed. It wasn't needed. Mm -hmm. And then I thought even maybe bringing another retail business would be a little bit... We might be slightly mm -hmm. in each other's way. So the, the artist wanted to stay and so we did another year lease with her. And so, but th that's all new to me. That and that's that risk. That's a business in itself. Taking to figure, you know, I had a lot of help to figure out the yeah. subleases. Um, and it, you know, some things are not my favorite, so I reach out and ask for. Yeah, help. how has that been to have your own business? Good, because from the beginning, one of the things I sensed was set it up 
to not burn myself out. Set it up so I am in the flow of doing what I do well. So I made the decision to hire a bookkeeper mm -hmm. and an accountant. And I think a bookkeeper is like an angel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an amazing, for me, it's an amazing yeah. thing. Um, because so many details can be funneled to her and um, not have to stay top of mind for me. Mm -hmm. So I can be about my business. Yeah. That's been good. And then the consulting with the accountant, and that's a less frequent um, need, but just to have somebody with their eye on how to put the taxes together. Because mm -hmm. if I had to be doing it all, the worst. It, would, it, would, it would deplete me, yeah. and I need to stay energized and focused on, on the business part that I do well, the sourcing, the styling, the merchandising, the the environment, um, and and the the and the social media presence mm -hmm. and the promotion, those are things I do well, and I want to stay in that flow. So you do everything you like to do, and then yeah, I I still do things that I don't like to do. Yeah, um, some of the tasky things, some of the emailing, some of the follow up, I still do. There there has to be that part in any good mm -hmm. job, right? I think, uh, yeah, and I think um, it kind of sounds like the approach that you took to start, which was to have fun and and just provide value to people, kind of offsets a little bit that beginning stress maybe of the financial part yeah. and the business side yeah. of yeah. stuff, I yeah. think. That's what, when we opened our business, I didn't want it to have to pay my bills. Uh, that yeah, was yeah, how yeah. we set it up, yeah, yeah. Um, which made every decision so much easier yeah, because yeah. I didn't have to do it. Yeah. I didn't have to make any decisions based right. on financial, yeah. which yeah. just, I think, stresses. Yeah. Anything that has to do with money, I think, is just stressful, it's especially stressful. if that puts food on your table. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I had to bring in something at mm -hmm. this at this shift in our life. Um, and my husband's income is the stronger one, um, but when we first started, when I first started, it was pretty low pressure. Um, I knew I needed to bring in something, but uh, it didn't have to be a lot. And now I've set on an amount that I try to pay myself every mm -hmm. month, and I've. For the duration of the year, um, I've been able to pay myself every month except one. Wow. So that's that's good. good. Yeah. It is good. <laughs> yeah. It is. I know. Yeah. I yeah. Know. It is yeah. good. Yeah. When you start paying yeah. yourself on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah. a game changer. But I'm trying to work that in too to the yeah. model. Okay. Let's yeah. let's keep this going. So. Yeah. 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 And it's all you. Is it just you? Uh, I, tailor? I have um, staff that I have cover one or two days a week. Okay. So that's my max. Yeah. Is one or two days a week, and that's That's one of the more challenging pieces, because someone who's only going to get uh, two days a week maximum mm -hmm. has to be doing other things, mm -hmm. and then they may get a full time offer. So I've had some mm -hmm. fabulous people. Um, I have somebody now that I hope will stay a little while, maybe. He'll work, you know, his side gigs together mm -hmm. so he can stay here. And he's very talented and eager and loves learning and styling. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's challenging. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the yeah. most challenging, I think, yeah. of uh, owning a business is yeah. the employee piece and then yeah. providing, I mean, no one's going to be as good as you are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe. I'm kind of thinking, maybe. well, this. Yeah. Um, Setting people free yeah. to learn, to explore, and maybe, uh, and I'm, I'm open-handed, you know, figure, yeah, build your clientele. Yeah, maybe they bring in yeah. another yeah. little eye yeah. to yes. the look. Yes, yeah. that would be very cool. Yeah. So you have four grown kids. Yes. Okay, and you guys are, I, I, ta I talk to a lot of women through. We need to try and turn the heat up. <laughs> No, it's okay. Right. We can talk. We can talk for okay. it. Um, I feel like there's like 
honestly age they're they're lost. Mm. But I don't feel like you're lost at all. I feel like you're the opposite. Yeah. So I how? Feel the like how? I us, feel the opposite. Help us. Like how yeah. did you? Like not only that, but I feel like so many people, even their kids are grown, but they're you're supporting them and they're they're making decisions in their own life and in their own relationship not to live. That's how I feel. To still continue to try to live for or through their kids. Yeah, I had an you know aversion. I had an aversion to that from the very beginning. And oh, tell me about so it. So I, when we were mating and breeding, yeah. having our, uh, making our, our life with home and family. The primary thing I would say is that my husband and I had this, the internal knowing that our relationship to each other was more important mm -hmm. than our relationship to, yep. with our kids. Mm -hmm. Not that they were uh, unimportant, mm -hmm. not at all, but that our investment in each other. And you guys knew that from the beginning? Yeah. We had to go through it, yeah. halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. When they were out of the toddler stage. We, we, we started, we started. So that, in a sense, that set us up um, to continue on allowing the invention of ourselves mm -hmm. and trying to empower our kids not through too much rescue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes rescue. Yeah. Some, um, always a balance. But, um, and then when it was back in the 80s and 90s that I was. Primarily stayed home long, but because I had this sense of needing to cultivate my own identity, we set it up so for a while Saturday was my day out, mm -hmm. um, and I did um, side businesses really in small increments that could be done from home. Started to develop my fitness business mm -hmm. when the fourth. Fourth was born. Yeah, had her in six weeks in a car seat while I had rented a little gym and was teaching step aerobics. Mm -hmm. you know, it was it was just like a hassle. Why do it? Well, it's good to stay in the cultivation of your, um, your passions and your skills, mm -hmm. even if it's just in the margins. Mm -hmm. Do do something in the margins. Um, that's, uh, I, I had, before I opened the shop, I had a short six month gig that I did where I was coaching a friend and another woman business person. She wanted me to, to be her coach and to prod her in a direction with her business. And what I came to when I was thinking about how to most effectively help her was underneath everything, and this could be for business, for personal, self-development to not get lost underneath every decision ask what am I cultivating mm -hmm. it's just like a fast way to help you align your actions align your investment with mm -hmm. a trajectory that you actually want mm -hmm. I used to ask my yoga students if you keep doing what you're doing the way you're doing it where will you be in five years we asked that. Oh, yeah. We asked that on the phone when people call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what we asked. Yeah, and you can make a lot of um, almost easy decisions if you yeah. say, "What am I cultivating? What's my trajectory?" So and I think sometimes with women, I have this conversation um, with women around my age that are like, "Well, I want to go back to work, or I want to do something, but then the kids, and I need help, and I need..." Yeah. And I'm like, it's not always because then it always yeah. goes to money. Like money is an yeah. easy yeah. way for people to like offset. Well, yeah. it wouldn't really like I wouldn't really make that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not so much about uh, the money. Yeah. It's about the value and what you're giving yourself. And sometimes, I mean, I think that I just would worry that if you didn't do anything, it sounds like you had this figured out. When the kids were out of the house, what were you going to do? Right. You were starting to figure it out. Oh, yeah. Twenty years. <laughs> it's just been. I, well, we talked about this the other day, and 
CrossFit, I think we were working on Toes to Bar and had some little breakthrough. And I, I thought, oh, it's so satisfying when you have these little breakthroughs. And that's what, what I love is a journey of small breakthroughs. If you keep that idea, too, for self-development, be on a journey of small breakthroughs. You don't have to be in this on-off. Either I'm going to get a new career or never mind. Yeah. Be on a journey of small breakthroughs. And that, when I go back to the story of when those three hard things happened, um, or, or to do hard things, mm -hmm. I think I had a sense that I wasn't really tapping my potential. And that that's part of our duty, I think. Mm -hmm. is to tap into our potential. Because you do, and that's very empowering and exciting for yourself, but then you know, it's, you know, you're using your skills and you're affecting people. Mm -hmm. And does age ever come into play with you? As you get older and what your fear level or your mm -hmm. um, risk and adversity, like, I don't know. Well, I mean, that the setup that I told you really made me more open to this. Yeah. Um, and a sense of, I guess you could say, age and time that, uh, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. A sense of, um, I don't know if I would say urgency, but more a sense of not wanting to waste. Don't waste. Definitely, but you know, I think. Did you see the Facebook picture of me? I was 31 and then no, 56. The, the, oh, the, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're looking yeah. at it. <laughs> so, I was like, so I'm stronger and fitter now, yeah. and it isn't through magic, it's through small little moves um, in a direction. Mm -hmm. And so, I hope to keep going in that direction but you know um, 25 years from now I'll be 81 so I can't make you any promises yeah. <laughs> but but that's but I, but going in a direction is still valuable mm -hmm. instead of again this on off way of living I think the fear I don't know how you feel but I feel each year I get my fear level yeah, I, I think I, I would agree. I don't, yeah. there's not a lot yeah. I'm scared of. Yeah. Or, and along those same lines, each year I care a little bit less about what anybody else thinks. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Where I yeah. used to think that was one thing I wish I could give myself as a young, yeah. younger in my 20s. Yeah. To just, say, God, if I could have gotten yeah. over that faster, or just, it really yeah. doesn't matter. I think I was harder on myself when I was younger, uh, and just that, I see it in, in you know, one of my daughters, that wrestling, just wrestling, 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 and, mm -hmm. and um, I think though that I, I, I have less fear and I have um, more ease, partly because of my partnership. Mm -hmm. we, keep cultivating that growth together as soulmates. And so that thing is this beautiful base to be able to spring off and, and do other things for both of us. So I think that's part of age bringing us here. Mm -hmm. How long have you guys been together? 34 years. Wow. Very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's okay, so I ask every person who comes on the same question. If you could, we might have just answered it. If you could give your 15 year old self oh, any advice. Yeah, sometimes people argue with me and they want to say like 17, and I'm like, yeah. okay. You could give your teenage oh. girl fashion. Were you into fashion? Always? Well, in a way, in high school, but it's just, yeah. Oh, there was some <laughs> oh, there was, oh, well, that was probably one of my most tumultuous times of life, was 15 Ooh. to 20-ish, so, why? just, 
from wild antics and uh, the search for love led to some dark places. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how I could, um, I don't know what the advice would be to that person, but something about holding on to to your heart and pacing yourself without worry and not giving yourself away for that in desperation on that switch.